so our last speaker, I should mention that lunch will be at 1 p.m. and so we'll still have plenty of time for our last speaker. Felix Miller Planes is uh, here from the University of New York. All right, so let's get started. We have a lot of ground to cover here. <laughs> um, so I am, I think, the third uh, German in the lab. So after uh, Florian, Gethin, and then myself. And I think I'm the last German also in the lab. So I'm interested in chromatin remodeling enzymes, which are molecular machines that sculpt the nucleus on landscape. And before I start on that, I, I'd like to share this picture with you. Um, of Dan, um, so and I think this summarizes there are many many characteristics of Dan. Uh, alert, super focused, and with his X-ray eyes, he, he sees the tiniest little bit of inconsistency. Is it? <laughs> and we have seen his X-ray eyes already in action during Rick's talk. And uh, <laughs> so, um, perhaps also so attached, combative, and and intimidating. Um, and for that reason, I thought, how uh, uh, talking about my, how would have Dan given this talk? Um, <laughs> actually, um, then I realized actually I've never heard of any of his talks. Um, <laughs> although technically, technically, I was actually sitting in one of them. Um, it was a practice talk he gave uh, in a lab meeting, and, uh, and I found it so. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> I'm lacking the proper adjective. <laughs> so. Long story short, I doze off. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I didn't say I passed out, okay? <laughs> All right, um, didn't expect that reaction, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, um, so uh, I guess you ha you'll have to live with uh, how I came up with uh, to how to do this talk. All right, so um, I have been always interested in, in how, uh, how the DNA is, is packaged uh, in, into the nucleus uh, through chromatin and molecular machines. And during my PhD, I, uh, I worked on two isomers too, it was a piece of cake. And in the middle of this, uh, of my PhD cake, so thanks guys, by, by the way, for designing that. In the middle of this, uh, of my PhD cake, you see me dreaming, uh, you see this, this overly eager uh, uh, PhD student um, <laughs> dreaming about experiments that I may have should have, uh, should have done, I guess. Um, so, and with these credentials, I thought it's, uh, it's time to apply a postdoc. In some, in the time to Peter Becker's lab at the University of Munich, we will finally put my feet up again. <laughs> um, so, uh, in Peter's lab, I started studying nucleus and remodeling enzymes, which are actually machines that take uh, those disordered nucleosomes and, and order them into the canonical nucleosome architecture around genes and promoters, which is illustrated here. So, around the transcription start site, we have these, nuc these nucleosome depleted region and downstream. We'll find this array of nucleosomes of very evenly ordered uh, nucleosomes. There's a hallmark of chromatin conserved from these domain. And without those remodeling enzymes, uh, cell, the cell suffers from various consequences, including fortuitous transcription, transport and misexpression, genome instability, uh, disease, including cancer, and we think also premature aging, and we're testing it in the lab. Um, so, uh, now, um, nucleosome remodelers have various different activities, including uh, the position of, of, uh, of uh, sorry, the position of nucleosomes and ejection of nucleosomes, nucleosome spacing, uh, nucleosome sliding, so where the enzyme takes the nucleosome and moves it along the DNA, and last but not least, exchange of histones for histone variants. Now, um, so uh, all these activities are brought about by a large family of remodeling enzymes, and they're illustrated here, and all of which are related to DNA helicase, <coughs> which will become important later in my talk. Um, now, uh, of course, I started dreaming of uh, the mechanism, structure, and function of these remodeling enzymes, um, and uh, today I'm going to share uh, two stories about the mechanism and structure uh, of the ISY class of remodeling enzymes. So ISY, uh, this uh, uh, slides nucleosomes along the DNA in an anti-plantarian fashion. This is the molecule. Um, it has a C-terminal HSS domain and an N-terminal HPS domain. Uh, the HSS domain is known, was known to bind flanking, the so DNA that flanks the nucleosomes, so the link the DNA, whereas the, the HPS domain is known, was known to bind to nucleosome DNA. Now, how does it slide? Well, this was the, um, the favorite uh, hypothesis or the favorite model when I started uh, by, uh, working on this. 
Um, the HPS domain was uh, suggested to pull, physically pull at the HLS domain. Because the HLS domain um, binds to flanking DNA, the idea was that flanking DNA uh, enters the nucleosome forming this DNA loop. And this DNA loop was then proposed to, to uh, propagate around the nucleosome and exit on the other side. And many people have to put their weight behind this model. So, um, uh, by the way, including my point, by the <laughs> so, um, so the uh, prediction was that DNA, uh, that DNA would enter uh, by a power stroke. And I was interested in testing this with this model. Um, however, uh, so, um, something that neither Dan nor, nor my postdoc advisor ever figured out, my gels look like a piece of um, <laughs> uh, art. <laughs> 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 uh, this is an actual factual gel that I collected. It's one of the better ones. <laughs> the importance of teaming up with competent people. Um, and uh, I hired my first uh, PhD student, Johanna Wilkinson, seen here exposing our toxic chemicals. <laughs> so uh, together we tested uh, the model. Uh, um, so the idea was to prevent the power stroke. Um, and the idea was that we inserted uh, uh, flexible glycine loops uh, in, in all kinds of places between the HPS domain and the HPS domain. Um, and the idea was then that without the power stroke, uh, the prediction was that you well, we shouldn't see any remodeling. So um, to test that, we first developed a quantitative remodeling set, and then could compare all kinds of insertion mutants uh, where we inserted this flexible loop into different places uh, with the idea of hitting at least one element sooner or later that will actually transduce the force with their same. So um, here are the results. So, so wild type remodeling um, is shown here uh, on the left. You can see all those insertion mutants actually uh, uh, remodeled the same um, as wild type. So remodeling was unperturbed, and you could even chop off the entire HLS domain, and we could still see remodeling. So for those reasons, we suggested that there is actually no power stroke going on with the linker DNA. Rather, we think that the APPS domain that lies here, um, uh, uh, because it is derived from DNA helicase, so it can transplicate uh, DNA, as can also be uh, shown by other people. Um, so it would start transferring the DNA and pump DNA basically towards, towards the diet. Um, uh, in addition uh, to that, it may also change the, the octopus structure, which then again uh, 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 may uh, uh, weaken histone DNA uh, contacts, which then would lead to loops of spiding. And in the exciting day, these are actually uh, showed confirmation changes inside of the loops on this data. So um, in the second part of my, my talk, I'm going to talk more about the structure of ice line. So, uh, uh, so this, this seemed like a suicide mission because um, uh, many excellent crystallography labs have tried for a decade or so to crystallize ice by uh, in various fashions, plasma mines, nucleosome, etc., and they failed. And I thought, well, uh, great, let's do that too. Uh, because if we fail too, then at least we're in good company. And <laughs> some, for, for some reason, only Nadine was very enthusiastic to, to work on this. And she first looked at crystal structures, available crystal structures of related enzymes, of the HPS domain of related enzymes, and they are expelled here. Um, the HPS domain consists of two lobes, lobe one and lobe two. Uh, each lobe individually is highly conserved, however, the relative orientation of those two lobes uh, uh, is very divergent, as you can see. Sometimes lobe one is on the left, sometimes it's on the right, sometimes it's at the top of lobe two. So we or she wondered uh, which of those confirmations, if any, would our Drosophila enzyme is true. So how did she do that? Well, she thought that uh, she could uh, uh, site-specifically incorporate crosslinkers, and then with by crosslinking she could probe the confirmation. So um, through by technological tricks developed in the Schultz lab, um, it's possible to uh, charge a, a tRNA with this unnatural amino acid called BPA because the tRNA will then recognize the TNG star codon. BPA gets incorporated into the nascent protein chain. BPA is a UV reactive uh, uh, cross linking uh, amino acid um, and forms these cross links provided that the neighboring amino acid is reasonably close, like less than 15 ohms strong. We then thought we are. Uh, we, uh, isolate those or remap those with those cross things through mass spectrometry, but because there was literally, li literally no single uh, software available to map those cross things in MS data, we actually uh, uh, design our own and we are really sharing this with anyone. So, <coughs> so um, what are the results? Uh, so shown here is a homology model of the APS domain, uh, modeled on the closest available structure at the time from the CHD1. 
And all those, those rods are the cross links that we identify. You can see here that the color of those cross links span really large distances in, in this model, uh, larger than 30 ohms, meaning that those cross links are not consistent with this particular confirmation. So we ask then, um, how can we improve uh, uh, this, this structural model so that those cross links are also satisfied, that the distance restraints coming from those cross links are satisfied by the model. So we teamed up um, with uh, Christina Schindler in the Isaias lab and performed uh, cross-link guided uh, rigid body docking of those two nodes against the uh, lens arms. And she came up with, um, with the following model. If she allows log one to rotate, uh, then she would, uh, then she predicted that this particular confirmation is, is uh, well, it's not only structurally stable, but also that those cross links are nicely satisfied. So, when we saw that, it looks, looks nice, but can we trust the model? We were very critical, um, uh, because this confirmation was uh, yet another uh, confirmation not previously crystallized. Uh, it was in an inactive state, so it can't hydrolyze, as you can see in a second. Um, so uh, we started then validating this novel interface by Mueller Genesis that ultimately, of course, you would like to see, you would like to compare your, your model to um, an actual high-resolution structure. And we were very fortunate that um, the Chen lab uh, published uh, the, uh, the crystal structure at some point, and then we could, find, we could compare our model to the crystal structure. And you see here a superimposition of those two models. You can see how, it, how extremely close uh, they are. So, um, very gratifyingly, we, uh, we saw that we correctly predicted the crystal structure in our in solution in the crystal structure and nicely cross-validate each other. So, um, in conclusion, um, ISY assumes yet another confirmation, uh, um, not previously crystallized. And um, uh, if this is in, in an inactive state, it needs to, needs to undergo large confirmation change in order to achieve the active state as defined uh, by the Fauna lab uh, last year. So, um, and this consists of the exact data that we also collected. Um, now, why don't we continue? Right. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so, we then, so now we had a nice model of the HPS domain, and then we asked um, how, what, what the full length structures, basically, how does the, this, the HPS domain, connect uh, uh, in three dimensions to the crystals, to the HS domain, for which there was a crystal structure. We use, in this case, a lysine-specific chemical cross-linkers, well, which is just cross-link, lysine to lysine. So, um, these are the results. Each arc represents a cross-link, and the green arcs uh, highlight those cross-links that connect the APS domain to the HS domain. And we, would, we use those, uh, those cross-links then to adopt uh, the, um, the HS domain against the APS domain. And that's, that is the final model already which nicely uh, fits all the Zach's data that she collected with Dan Lippert, who uh, fits in the audience, who's very in um, <laughs> All right, um, so, um, well, uh, now, when we analyzed it, when we looked at this model, we, we saw that um, the nucleus and binding surface of low one, shown here in yellow, is, is actually is exposed. So we, we suggest, for that reason, that this is the first to dock against the nucleus zone, shown here in gray. However, um, in order to achieve this active state uh, that is as defined um, by, uh, by the Kramer lab last year, um, log 2 must uh, swing over uh, in order to reach, this, uh, to reach its uh, active, uh, active state. It can't swing over, however, un uh, unless the, the cyan and the green HS uh, domain have released log 2, meaning um, that they are the cyan is the internal region, by the way, so unless they, they have to release and then uh, the red log 2 can swing over. Now finally, uh, as I told you before, the, the HS domain is known to bind to flank in the email. so after release, it can then swing over in order to reach its active site on the LinkedIn. So, um, uh, so I told you two stories about uh, our dreams, about mechanism and structure. Uh, I should say what I presented today is, uh, is not at all predictive of what we are doing right now and in the future. So we are, in most of the labs now working in view of, uh, to elucidate some of the functions of not only ISPAR but also other modelers and also involving other uh, activities. 
So with that, so my lab sends readings from the approval test, the, the original, not, not any fake ones. Um, <laughs> so I, I told you about, the, this is my lab here, I told you about Johannes and Nadine's um, work, PhD work, my first two grad students. Um, I thank my collaborators, uh, including Jan and uh, Christina Schindler, who is a fabulous modeling job in uh, Ignazi, uh, in Axel Emmons lab, with whom we have done the MS together. Um, my funding sources, and of course Dan. Dan for having a um, <laughs> watchful eye um, on this uh, budding uh, scientist <laughs> with overgrown hair. Um, <laughs> and um, so uh, Dan to, uh, taught me how to and also how not to do science. And I guess the jury is out there which side I picked. Um, <laughs> so, so, so certainly I, I owe Dan uh, a lot in terms of what I am as a scientist today. And so, um, so with that, uh, Happy birthday, Dan. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions. <coughs> or we can also just go for lunch. <laughs> so, so can you hypothesize what, what the what the order of events are to to, to slide and to, to go, you know, to, to the, through the cycle? I would love to know. And so this is obviously, um, well, the answer is, of course, we don't know. So we need uh, much better essays with high resolution front pairs, perhaps, and Gita may actually uh, find that out so soon. So the order of events during the catalytic cycle is of active, uh, it's active research in many labs. And um, I would be a happier scientist if I, if I knew. So, very good question. Everyone is interested in that. Not everyone, but I everyone is for you. Hi, I have a question. So, it's, just, it's more technical, but what, what did you learn using these cross linkers in terms of how best to map them and the worry about, you know, kind of intermolecular versus intramolecular types yeah. of process? So, what I didn't mention is that uh, we uh, like to, uh, we like to, subject the crosslink material to uh, um, the size exclusion chromatography in order to isolate the uh, monomeric peak. Um, and for that reason, we hope at least that uh, we, we only map intramolecular uh, uh, crosslinks, because otherwise it becomes really dicey um, uh, in terms of the interpretation. And also we, can, we, we also run an SDS page and then, uh, uh, and then from that, we can also deduce the, uh, the um, uh, quaternary structure of, of our models. So I assume the, the crosslinks are done under different conditions with the same distance crosslink, or do you also vary the crosslink and superimpose that on top of whatever the other variables are? So um, basically, your question is if we can learn by varying the, the, the crosslink that uh, reach whether we can learn something about the, the structure. Right? Um, people have tried that, so, so we didn't really go into, into that. So people have tried that and their, conclu their conclusion was that it doesn't really help. Yeah, after, after so um, after all, at least for the chemical crosslinkers, the, um, the resolution is quite low because it's like the, the close to 30 angstrom essentially. But if you extend that to a 35 angstrom, you, you don't le learn so much from, from that. Thank you, Felix. Sure.